Hey folks, we are hard at work on a new upscaled for you about non-silicon transistors and all sorts of cool technology that they help enable. But Intel just went and dropped about 20 new processors on us, so we are going to take a brief pause to check in and let you know what is new with these new Intel 10th gen chips. Hint, aside from more cores, not a ton. These are Intel's 10th gen Comet Lake desktop chips, and they run all the way from high-end i9 desktop chips down to Celeron and low-powered Pentiums. The flagship, though, is definitely the i9-10900K, a mammoth 10-core, 20-thread chip that can boost a single core all the way up to 5.3 gigahertz, or all cores, to a still very speedy 4.9 gigahertz. Intel is defining these speeds with a new thermal velocity boost, where with enough cooling headroom, it'll work a little more like a GPU, and increase increase speeds until it hits a maximum temperature, in this case 70 degrees C. With a poor CPU cooler, you might be stuck with the standard boost of only 5.1 GHz or 5.2 using Intel's Turbo Boost 3.0. This is another type of boost speed that we first actually saw back on the X-Series processors, where the chip tries to identify the best performing core and send workloads that way to eke out an extra 100 MHz or so. If you want to know any more, we can try to do a future episode on all the various boosts at some point. It is getting to be an awful lot of them. Will those extra 1 or 200 megahertz really matter? Well, probably not, but even all cores running just at the base 4.9 gigahertz should make for a seriously speedy chip. And it's not crazy expensive either. We're expecting this to retail for about $500. Now, I know Intel's official slides say 488, but that is for volume pricing, buying them a thousand at a time so unless you are planning a seriously fast computer, expect it to be a bit higher than that. The KF series chips drop Intel's integrated GPU for a cost savings of about 15 bucks. These prices are actually about the same as what Intel's previous flagship, the i9-9900KS was, but you're getting two more cores and a faster boost speed. Not a bad deal. Two more cores does mean more heat to deal with, and Intel is combating this by thinning the die. The literal chip itself is about 40% thinner, and it's soldered to a thicker heat spreader, which should help the chip dump more heat. That's crucial because these chips are going to use a lot of power. The unlocked K-series chips are rated for 125 watts, but with Intel's kind of squirrely power measurements, what that really refers to is how much power the chip is expected to draw while running in sustained usage but not boosting, which is never how a chip actually works in the real world. For comparison, the 95-watt 8-core i9-9900K actually drew closer to 170 watts in general usage. And with two more cores and rated at 125 watts, I would expect the i9-10900K to draw almost as much as 250 watts. Intel is adding more overclocking tools at least. Hyperthreading can now be enabled or disabled per core, and frequency versus voltage can be adjusted on a curve, which means a potentially high-performing chip could be tuned to just sip power under normal usage, but still draw all the watts it needs to really overclock and hit those high frequencies. Speaking of hyperthreading, the big news is that it is now enabled on every chip from the i9 all the way down to the i3. No more weird market segmentation. Hyperthreading lets a chip sometimes run two instructions at once, and in the right workloads, it can boost performance by about 25%. The i7 chips do lose the fancy thermal velocity boost, but the top line chips still have a boost speed of 5.1 gigahertz and eight cores with 16 threads, which means the i7-10700K is essentially the same chip as Intel's i9-9900K, their first big flagship eight core, five gigahertz chip, except it costs a hundred bucks less. However, unlike the 9900K, the new i7 doesn't come packaged in a fancy crystal dodecahedron, so it's garbage and we can't recommend it. Dodecahedron. The i5 line is honestly where most people will be looking to buy, and it's actually pretty impressive. The i5-10600K will be a six core, 12 thread chip that can boost up to 4.8 gigahertz and will probably retail for about 280 or $300. Drop down just a tier and you're at the 10500, which is still a six core chip at 4.5 
5 gigahertz, but probably for about $200. Compared to Intel's offerings from just a few years ago, that's actually insane value. But we haven't really talked competition here, and if I look online right now, I can find an AMD 3700X for $295. Now, that may run a little bit slower per core, but it'll get me 8 cores to the i5-6. If you're looking for any sort of performance, the i3 line has typically been worth skipping, but maybe not anymore. The i3-10300 is a 4-core, 8-thread chip that can boost up to 4.4 gigahertz and will probably cost about $150. That may not sound like much compared to the other chips here, but that's essentially an i7-7700K. Intel's top-end flagship from three years ago? That's probably still going to be enough for most games or daily tasks, and you're going to be able to buy that for under $200, which is kind of incredible. Still, if you're really price conscious, AMD's 3300 and 3100 chips were recently announced, and we're expecting them to be four-core processors for about $100 or $120, bucks. so we'll have to see what ends up actually being faster. So that's the good news. Now on to the downsides. Yes, these chips will require a new motherboard. While AMD has managed to keep the AM4 platform running for a while, Intel has a tendency to change chipsets on a whim. The new Z490 chipset could bring some exciting new features, but for now, pretty much all we're seeing is Wi-Fi 6 on a few models? Exciting stuff. The one ray of hope is rumors that Intel plans to keep its next batch of new chips compatible with these new Z490 motherboards, and that those chips will enable PCI Express 4.0 features for super fast storage. Because yes, unfortunately, this current batch of chips on Z490 will still be stuck with PCI Express 3. And despite being called 10th gen, these chips are not 10 nanometers. Intel is still stuck using the same 14 nanometer manufacturing process process that we first saw back in 2014, and it's also still a refinement of the Skylake architecture we've been seeing since 2015. Credit where it's due, they have milked a lot of performance out of an aging process node and architecture, and we do expect the 10900K will probably be the fastest gaming chip around. But that said, how many games are really CPU bound at this point? As long as you've got four or six relatively fast cores, the GPU really makes the biggest difference. And for super multi-threaded intensive workloads like rendering video, we expect AMD's 12-core 3900X will still be competitive, and you can find that right now for $430. Aside from more cores, we're not expecting any huge performance leaps until Intel finally gets its desktop processors onto a new architecture or a new manufacturing process. This current set does seem fast, and it's pretty competitive against AMD's current chip but it's honestly priced a little higher than we'd like. And with AMD set to announce its crop of 2020 processors any day now, its current offerings could be getting another price cut. This year's new AMD chips aren't expected to be a giant improvement either, though. We're looking at a refinement of the 7 nanometer process and probably some small improvements in frequency or instructions per clock. We won't see a huge improvement from AMD until their 5 nanometer chips launch, hopefully in 2021. And hopefully by that point, Intel will be off the 14 nanometer node as well. Still, as we always say, competition is great for consumers. And since AMD has become a functional processor manufacturer again, we've seen the number of cores you can buy for your dollar more than double, and desktop performance is finally climbing again. Hopefully AMD's fourth gen Ryzen chips will be announced soon, and they'll be super speedy, and the competition will be such we'll all be able to buy 12 core, 6 gigahertz chips for $11. Until that day though, how about a little more competition in the GPU space, huh? Where's that discrete graphics card? you keep promising Intel? Or how about Navi 2, AMD? We could use a little shake-up there. In the meantime, we'll keep an eye out for all of those, so stay tuned to Engadget and stay inside and wash your hands. We'll catch you next time.